The way we consume and share news today, it is largely rooted in social media outlets. The reason why it's crucial to look at what's being discussed online for our daily social media minute. We're joined by Erica. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Did you have a lot of great Chisok food? Uh, yeah, I tried to um, restrain myself somewhat compared to other years, but uh, yeah, but yeah, there was Plenty of great food. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. How about you? Yes, I did. But you're right to say that I, I try to refrain from having too much food because it never feels too good afterwards. <laughs> why do why do holiday foods have to be so high in calories? Hearty. I, I feel like that's Very hearty. universal. I mean, I don't think you're yeah. supposed to eat that much turkey. I'm going to go to American Thanksgivings. Uh, Korean <laughs> chan, same thing. It's delicious. Yeah. But should you have like basket full of uh, fried pancake? <laughs> basket full of fried pancake. Yeah, candy. I oh, mean, yeah. that's what it yeah. looks like. It's, it funny. tastes great. But I try to refrain to you. Welcome back, yeah. Erica. Let's get started. Thank now, yep. it seems that not everyone had a chance to bid farewell, which is part of the disappointment. An iconic movie theater, Dan Gukjang, has closed after 66 years. Yeah, so uh, Daehan Gukjang, um, you know, during a time when Chungguro uh, <laughs> uh, was uh, the heart of Korea's film industry, the theater kind of like stood as uh, its crown jewel. Mm. Uh, the movie theater opened back in the 50s. In 1958, uh, at the time, it was a single screen uh, theater and uh, it soon became a staple in Korean cinema. It showed blockbuster hits like the 1959 film Ben-Hur, uh, the 1955 film The Sound of Music, all of the classics we're talking about I just about here. wonder what it would have been like to be the first to see The Sound of Music or Ben-Hur, <laughs> considered longtime Hollywood yeah. classics in theaters. I mean, this is when... Uh, not even movie posters were printed. They drew outside yeah. these uh, special monuments like Tiangukjang, and the way they right. attracted people in was with a pretty elaborate artistic endeavor. You know, I'm sure most of our listeners have seen it, both films, but uh, this was uh, the era of black and white film. <laughs> so they probably saw whoever went to uh, Tiangukjang back in the 50s and 60s. They saw these films in black and white. Anyways, um, the theater was designed by 20th Century Fox. Uh, it was Korea's first windowless theater, oh. which was built to keep out any light that might disrupt the viewing experience. We might take that for granted Absolutely. today, but not back in the days, right? So that was a very special feature of Tianlukjang uh, back in the days. And what made it stand out even more was its massive screen, uh, which was capable of showing 70 millimeter films rather than the 35 millimeter <laughs> films. It offered sharper images, richer colors, more detail on the big screen. And it was often used for epic films uh, or visually stunning scenes that made the viewing experience more immersive. Now, audiences were uh, back in the days, in awe of Ben Hur's iconic chariot race scene, and uh, the theater even nick uh, earned the nickname the Ben Hur Theater. Quite a name. Uh, back in the days. <laughs> right, and for many movie fans, the theater was filled with a lot of cherished memories. Mm. Uh, so its uh, rather sudden closure mm. has left many fans feeling like they didn't uh, get a proper chance to say goodbye and give it a proper send off. I remember, I think it was my parents, I said one of the first movies they ever watched was, yeah. um, ro it's one of the robots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from that generation, okay. but it, it was one of one of the big. Uh, anyway, I, I'll look for it as you describe our next story. But sure. um, what they did was they took the main character and they created sort of a lifelike uh, character a monument outside the theater. So it was a popular attraction for people to stand by, marvel yeah. at. 
I bet. <laughs> Taekwondo, was that a thing? Yeah, I think it might be that. <laughs> oh, I was actually thinking of that. If if we're talking about one of the robots, you know. <laughs> Surely, <laughs> there is a better way to describe this. I'll yeah. look it up just to double check. Okay. Yeah. But but Yerka, as you mentioned, not everyone had a chance to say goodbye to Theodore. The projected closing date was actually September 30th. So yes. why did it uh, close earlier than expected? And when did it stop screening films? Yeah, you know what? They uh, actually stopped screening films altogether at the end of August, um, and then it hosted a pop up event for. Mm-hmm a sports brand Mm -hmm. until September 8th and starting September 9th, the venue shut its doors for good. Now, both the main entrance uh, on the ground level and the underground walkway from Chumuro subway station exit one are now closed off uh, because remodeling works are currently Uh underway. Yeah. All right. So on the theater's official, it's funny, they have an Instagram page. Now, of course they yes. do. Nostalgia comments have been flooding in. It's just funny because we're talking about like the 50s and black and white films. And now yeah. to keep up with its legacy, they have an Instagram page. That's right. So one user wrote on uh, Tan Guk Jung's official Instagram page, quote, I remember going to Tan Theater with my family when I was young. It's filled with memories. I wish I'd had the chance to say a proper farewell. Another person commented, I wanted to visit before September 30th, but the screenings had already stopped. I wish they'd opened it up just one last weekend before uh. October. Uh, and these were just, uh, you know, a couple of the many, uh, you know, messages that were left um, on the Instagram uh, page account and many reminisced about their first ever movie theater experience there, their first date family outings, so many personal stories and memories. And there's something so special about just the one screen experience yeah. when you don't have a whole lot of options. We always thought many options would be better, right? It's it's good for diversity, but sometimes there's something beautiful about uh, collectively watching a single movie, no yeah. other choice. You're right, you're right. And it, it was Robot Tech One V. Oh, yay. <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> All right. So really, the theater experience has changed quite a bit. A multipack theater, there's a theater took over. Seoul's iconic single screen theaters began to fade away, including but really not limited to just Taehyung Gukjang. That's right. Tansongsa uh, was another theater. Myeongbo Gukjang, Myeongbo theaters closed back in 2008. Uh, Seoul Gukjang, or Seoul Theater, closed back in 2021. Piccadilly Theatre handed over its operations to CGV back in 2015. Um, and although Taehan Gukjang transitioned into an 11 screen multiplex in 2002, it couldn't keep up with uh, the bigger, the larger multiplex chains and the rise, of course, of uh, streaming services and years of financial losses eventually. Mm-hmm. Forced uh, it to close down. Now, Seki Sangsa, uh, which owns the building, plans to convert it into a performance space, and they're expected to debut a show called Sleep No More, which is inspired by Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, and it's it's an immersive show where you know people can move around basically. Right. Uh, the show has been apparently a big hit in London and New York. Something to lo- look forward to. You know, yeah. th- that immersive uh, theater experiences in itself is its own brand of performances. Some yeah. people love it. Some people hate it. I, I took my husband to it. He- <laughs> He was not too fond of it. Oh, okay. (laughs) I I think a fair warning would have been better, but I didn't tell him. I thought it might be a nice surprise, but he freaked (laughs) out when the actor started approaching him. (laughs) Panic. (laughs) All right. So saying goodbye to Tan Guk Jung right here in Seoul, South Korea. Now we turn our attention to our second buzzword this morning. Instagram announces a new policy that will force millions of teens into protected accounts. So this has been one of the biggest talking points, right? Just how much of safety nets do we need for teens, adolescents, minors, essentially? That's right. So this is very new news. Uh, Instagram on Tuesday announced its uh, most dramatic effort uh, to date 
to protect young users from uh, dangers and risks on the platform. It's implementing new teen account settings that is going to automatically make millions of teen accounts private Mm. and restrict what kinds of content those young users can view on the application. Now, the change to how Instagram lets teens use its platform comes almost three years after the explosive Facebook papers first drew mass attention to the risks the platform poses for younger users. Uh, and Instagram is going to automatically apply the new teen account settings to all users under the age of 18. Uh, and after the update, 16 and 17 year olds uh, will be able to manually change the app back to their preferred settings. But to users 13 to 15 years old, they will be required to obtain parental approval uh, to make such changes. Even before Facebook papers, there were many former employees at Facebook, Instagram, and other important social media services that served as whistleblowers. They gave interviews saying that it was designed to be addictive, it was designed to sort of pry on our weaknesses. And as full-grown adults, maybe we have the capacity for it, but should we be responsible for protecting minors? And uh, The short answer is yes, and Instagram is taking notice. So pressure on Meta to do more to protect teens have been ramping up, especially after that Facebook employee turned whistleblower said in November uh, to the Senate committee in the United States uh, that Meta's, including Meta's top executive, Mark Zuckerberg, ignored warnings for years about harms these platforms do to teens. That's right. Uh, Court documents from recent lawsuits against the company have alleged that uh, Zuckerberg repeatedly thwarted uh, the well-being of teen users uh, and that Meta knowingly refused to shut down accounts that belong to children under the age of 13 and uh, that the company has enabled child predators to do what they do to go after, uh, you know, young kids. Mm -hmm. Now, at a Senate hearing uh, back in January of this year, Mark Zuckerberg apologized to families who said their children had been harmed by social media. All right. So what does Meta's most recent changes aim to address at this point? Yeah, so the company aims to address parents' biggest concerns, which is who their teens are talking to online and the content that they're seeing and whether their time is being well spent on the platform. So the teen accounts update means that accounts for users under 18, both new users and existing users, will automatically be set to private and placed in the strictest messaging settings. Uh, The revision is going to allow allow teen users to receive messages only from people they are already connected to. Uh, Instagram is also going to limit who can tag teens in photos or mention them in comments to only people they follow. Now, additionally, teens uh, will be placed into Instagram's most uh, restrictive content control settings, and the shift limits the types of sensitive content teens can see on their Explore page Mm. and in Reels as well. Uh, Now, teen users will also receive time limit reminders uh, that sort of like nudge them to leave after spending one hour on the app each day. And the app uh, will default to sleep mode, uh, which means uh, that the notifications are going to be muted. Mm. And, uh, you know, the the app will send auto replies to direct messages between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. This is what I did for me. I'm a full grown adult, but I just don't like the disruption. Yeah. So I disconnected any alarms to any social media. Um, my yeah. emails even, they get, they get muted. <laughs> Sorry, from <laughs> 9 p.m. until 5 in the morning. Yeah. But that's fine, right? I'll check at 5. <laughs> yes. All right. So when will these changes be implemented, Yerika? Yeah, so, the, uh, so Instagram plans to apply the changes for all teen accounts in select countries starting next next week, including the U.S., before rolling out the policy to other countries, including South Korea, uh, later this year and uh, next year. Much belated, but better late than yeah. never, right? All right, on to our yeah. final story this morning. It's still a global phenomenon. It's still going. I asked my friends, are Trader Joe's kimbap still 
uh, yes, hard to come by. And yes, because they're so popular. But apparently in Korea, kimbap restaurants have been disappearing in doves. Yeah. So the Korean government recently reported a, a drop in the number of kimbap uh, in punjikjib or snack restaurants, which were once really popular for offering these quick and easy bites. Uh, experts say this is due to several factors. Number one, a growing trend of avoiding carb-heavy foods like rice or white rice. Uh, also, a shrinking population was another factor. Mm. And more people are choosing to grab quick meals from convenience stores or cafes instead of the, the, the conventional punjikjib or snack restaurants. The quality of convenience store food has come up uh, quite significantly in yeah. the last decade or so. So I'm sure that's a contribution. And perhaps the fact that at one point, maybe we had too many punjikjibs. I yeah. know, I know, it's, it's our soul food, but it, maybe there's too many. Maybe we can review the stats. What kind of insights do the numbers reveal? Uh, so according to government data, the number of kimbap restaurants steadily increased uh, until 2016. Uh, there were uh, 48,800 in 2020, but then starting in 2021, the number grew by only 0.2%. Uh, by 2022, the total had dropped by 4.6%, and that sort of like downward decline is continuing into 2024. But at the same time, other types of franchise restaurants are actually expanding. Mm. Uh, in 2022, there were 180,000 franchise food outlets, up 7.4% from the previous year. Restaurants serving baked goods, pizza, coffee, and alcohol all saw an increase in their numbers, ranging from 5% to 13%. But the biggest takeaway is that there's a shift in eating habits here in Korea. Mm. And, uh, you know, Koreans are definitely consuming less rice, much less rice. Mm. Uh, and they've been consuming other foods instead mm. of rice. So back in 2019, per person rice consumption fell below 60 kilograms for the first time here in South Korea, which is quite significant. Do you eat a lot of white rice? Because I see myself restricting myself too, right? I don't. I haven't eaten white rice in the longest time. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's a changing trend. I, I think it's a three forbidden white food, the, the white rice, white flour and Our white sugar. sugar. Right. Yeah. Uh, better health habits. Not so good for select businesses. Those are some of the impending changes. Thank oh. you so much, Erica. Pleasure. See you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.